All right, looks like we're ready to go here. Uh, today, I'm uh, sending an email to everybody, but, but uh, just to kind of give you the rundown, we're going to talk a lot about sectioning of cabinets today. We're also going to talk about um, the cab modes, uh, placing bling, and hopefully into the bid center, um, and getting through just the, the ordering process from us, for those that don't know that. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and just start here. I've got a couple of, of, of jobs that that I've saved to, uh, let's see here, let's start with this one. Um, we just started into cabinet sectioning yesterday, but we didn't really do it much justice, so I wanted to, to talk about that a little bit more today. Uh, first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, thin ends. I kind of just went over that very quickly yesterday. I didn't ever really like, do any explanation of how to apply it. I just did it and um, maybe caught it, maybe you didn't. Um, on stands of cabinets, there's several ways to apply them. I want to show you uh, all those different ways. So the, way, the easiest way that I think is from the planner elevation view. I can just go to a cabinet, right click on the cabinet, and just here to say finish stands, and I can say none, left, right, or both. So left finish end, we see our little finished end icon show up. Um, if I change that to right, we see that move, finished end, bolt, we see it on both sides. So so that's one way. Another way is actually from the cabinet level or the section editor. And remember from yesterday, we can access that by right clicking and hitting section. If I do that in the section mode, and what I want to notice here is this uh, window up here in the upper left corner, uh, that's actually a top-down view of the cabinet. So the front of the cabinet, the right side, the left side, and the back of the cabinet. So this is the sectioning editor. The other way to access this is just from double-clicking the cabinet going to the cabinet level. So I've got my cabinet in 3D. If I go, let me turn off the texture mode because it's running a little bit slow there. If I uh, go to my section view, for some reason that's not clicking there, anyway this way, uh, go to the section view, I see that same window here in the upper left corner. Uh, note in the, in the cabinet level I see a little year uh, designating an unfinished end. From this view I, I can click on the end and change. you'll notice my view changes from the sectioning view also. I can click here and change the end type. I can go here and tell it to be a finished end. Um, so it automatically turns that to a finished end from the, from this view. Um, and you can see that again. If I go to the color mode, I see the difference in the color of the core, the pink versus the green. So you'll see in the back the, the little red where our finished ends are, are rabbited out for the back to sit inside. So that's another cue that it's a finished end. But I can also see from the front view a finished end here now, an F. Um, there's one feature on here that isn't used very often, but uh, you might as well be aware of it, the automatic finish end. What that does is if end is exposed at all in the room, let me come back out here to the room level. Um, so right now you could see that end. So uh, let me turn this cabinet to a finished end none. Now this is the one we put the, the finished end automatic on. So if I take that finished end and butt it into the cabinet next to it, so I'm going to take the left clearance and tell it to be zero, our finished end arrow goes away. It is automatic, so it knows that that end is covered by an adjacent cabinet. Now, if for some reason I were to make this cabinet, uh, let's change its elevation. Um, let's go to 1,200 millimeters, so drop it down slightly. see there, the colors kind of blend together, but notice there's a finished end icon. That cabinet now knows that part of it is exposed, so it automatically sections that end. Now that will happen if you're hanging below or above, or if you change the depth of this cabinet. If we were still um, at the same elevation, notice finished end turns off, but now if I change that, instead of 12 inches deep, let's call it 18 inches deep or uh, 15 inches deep, excuse me. If I change that, now we see the finished end icon show up again. So an automatic end uh, will, will change 
it, it's whether it's exposed or not. So kind of handy feature. Um, it's not used very often just because you can't access it from the drawing view here. I just go here and right click finished end and pick which one I want. So so that's finished ends. Uh, hinging is similar to that. Um, although there are a couple of other quirks with hinging that we need to talk about. So on a single door cabinet, notice in the name it's a W left. When I drag that cabinet out, if I go to my wall cabinets, doors, I've got a W and a W L W U R. So those are specifically hinged one way in the name of the cabinet. So it's a single door uh, left, single door right. This is a double door. So that's what we're looking at out here. Now, double door hin uh, double door like this, you're obviously going to be hinged on the left and the right, unless you do a bifold kind of a, a setup. And I'll show you that here in just a second. But on a single door, uh, it's specific to a particular cabinet. However, if you right click on a cabinet, just like the finished ends, here I can say rehinge. And you'll, you'll notice on here when I click this, the handle and the hinges swap places, but also the name of the cabinet changed from a, a WRL to a WR. So, so changed. Another way to change the hinging, if you're in your sectioning mode, if I right click and section, um, you can just click in that door open and then just click on the handle. And that changes it from left to right. And again, the handle and hinges change places, but so does the name of the cabinet. Um, that's kind of a, a shortcut way of doing it too. Um, a double door cabinet. You need to alter those hinges somehow. Uh, since for like I said before, the bifold hinging. If I right click and section this door and click, you know what? Back up really fast. Let me go back over to this cabinet. There's one other thing I need to show you here. Sex cabinet. You can either come this handle like I just showed you. Or this left sidebar, there's also a hinge left or right. Notice how I can say hinge none if it's uh, connected to some sort of a mechanism, a pull-out spice unit, or if it's a ventose kind of stub thing, I could say hinge top. Um, and all this will change the location of the hinges and of the, the handle on that cabinet. Now, I wanted to show you this sidebar method is because notice on a single door cabinet, I have under door, I have hinge and top, left, right, bottom, or none, right? So if I double click on this cabinet to move my sectioning window from the single door cabinet over to the double door cabinet, now click on this. Notice I, it just says pair gap. It doesn't give me the option. What they're talking about is the gap between my doors. Um, Yesterday, you'd, you'd asked about potentially customizing those. Um, this would be another way you could do that is by changing that gap between the doors. Uh, so, But there's no right top bottom on a double door cabinet. The only way for us to do that, notice when I click in that opening also on this left sidebar, I've got pair doors selected. If I go back over, I'm going to double click on this single door cabinet to transfer the machining out. Transfer the machining. There we go. Uh, over the section view over to this cabinet. If I click on that door, notice it says a single door. So this is telling me what kind of a setup I have. Let me go back over to the double door cabinet again. If I were to change that to a door, we would see that just become one giant door. Um, you can change cabinet however you like. Obviously, just be aware that, I mean, that's a 33-inch wide door. It's it's most likely going to warp and do bad things. So you don't want to do that in most cases. but. But the system allows it. It'll it'll let you do it. Uh, go back to a pair of doors. Now again, so there's two individual doors here. I have one big blue window, meaning that section is treated as a single section, even though there are double doors in it. So any customizations I do in this, we talked yesterday about extending doors down. If I extend those doors down 51 millimeters, it extends both of them because both of those, it's one one section there. Both of those doors are linked. So um, what that translates to in hinging, though, is if I want to customize the hinging on this cabinet, I need to divide this one big section into two smaller sections. And the way I would do that is up here with a vertical split tool. So now I've split this. It looks the exact same, except for now I can select individual doors. I can resize them independently um, if I wanted to. I could also right-click and say equalize width, 
equalize width, and they'll go back to being equally split. But notice here the different shades of blue. They're both blue because they're linked by this equalize width setting. Um, let me turn that off. Um, so now I can independently change their hinging. So let's say I want it hinged on the left side of this door, but on this door I want it to also be hinged left. I can do that. I can. So in this case, you'd have to structurally change some things in the cabinet to make a, a inside kind of a face frame mullion recessed into the cabinet back here. So um, we don't see terribly often, but but it is possible to do. Another thing you can do here is make that door hinged none, and then um, that's for like a bifold setting. Although it renders kind of funny here. I don't know if you're going to want to handle here or over on this door. You can always on any door change the handle location if um, if you need to for a rendering. If you just, in your view, if I hide the section I want blue and then double click it, it will bring me here to this door properties window. This window is going to be used for a lot of things we do today. Um, we'll get into some of the other details about it later, but for now, the hinges or the poles, I can change um, the quantity of poles. I can put it at zero on the door. Then my hinges stay there, but my pole disappears. And then I come over to this door and tell it poles, and I want to change that to one. Now, what can be a little weird here is I'm not sure where it's going to place this hinge. We'll see what it does, or this, uh, excuse me, this pole. Uh, yeah, see how it places it kind of in a f funky position here. Um, if I go back to that pull now I, I can customize um, where it's in relation to. So if I do it from the bottom, um, let's see what that does. It says horizontally, an inch and a half, vertically, 76 or three inches. Okay, so that's exactly where it was sitting. Um, we can come here though, we can rotate the pole. Um, let's see what that does to it. So that rotated it. Um, you kind of get the idea, we can start positioning that. that um, that pole so it looks correctly uh, on your screen, but and how you would change hinging, sort of customize hinging on on a uh, bifold cabinet. Um, let's finish ends and hinging. Let's uh, get to some sectioning of um, yesterday about the the reveals. I want to talk about, about customizing these doors and drawer fronts. Now I'm going to add color to this so you can see these doors and drawer fronts a little better. My my drawer fronts, all block fronts on this job. I, I put three groups of the exact same type of cabinet in here to, to illustrate a couple of things today. Um, here to my room setting and go to log. Um, I'm going to bypass this window and go here to my doors. So notice I've set up with a Bainbridge raised panel door and a block drawer front, a simplicity block drawer front. Um, I have multiple choices here. I have a, a Bainbridge raised panel drawer front or a Bainbridge raised panel nail drawer front. And I'll show you the difference between these three. Right now you're seeing on your screen the block fronts. It's pretty obvious. The Bainbridge raised panel drawer front, if I select that and hit finish, you'll see what this does. Um, okay. We've got a problem here, and we'll, this is something I want to watch for. In fact, this very thing came up just this morning with with the designer. Notice my top drawer fronts disappeared. Um, there's something wrong with that drawer front style that I selected. Let's go back into it. When I picked it, I just picked the drawer front. I didn't change any of these specs up here. Notice on my base and my upper door, I've got Naughty Alder with a number one edge and an A panel. Um, if I go to my drawer, it's Naughty Alder with a number one edge and a B panel. Um, that's just what it stood by default because I didn't come up here and customize it, but I come up here and tell it to be something different. Uh, the B panel is slightly, it's a slightly bigger panel uh, than the A panel. And so what happened is as that, as these smaller drawer fronts get smaller and smaller, the part the panel portion in the middle of the, of the drawer front is so small that it, it the two files get to where they're almost touching. If that ever happens on a panel profile, Cabinet Vision just says, no, it's not possible, I'm not going to do it. So it makes the drawer front disappear like this. It's a warning to you that there's something wrong with the drawer style you've selected. Uh, the downside to this, and you have to watch this closely, is that if this happens on a job and you don't 
notice that this has happened. Those drunts not only are not visible, but they are not pricing. So you have to watch that really closely uh, so you don't inadvertently underprice a job because your drawer fronts are, are all invisible. So now on this uh, setting my panel, my doors were an A panel. Uh, some people like to have those drawer front uh, race panels match your doors exactly. Uh, oh, let's try that and see what happens here. I'm going to pick an A panel. Takes a second after you make a change for that to, to register. Okay, so in this case, it worked just fine. Uh, every once in a while, when you pick that A panel or uh, or any race panel for that matter, um, it may or may not work in smaller drawer fronts. And so, when that's the case, most of the time, what we see people doing is on your panel profile on a drawer is you pick an A drawer panel. The files look similar. There's a similar shape. The difference on any of these with a DRW after the end of the name of the drawer uh, or the panel is that that profile is just smaller. It's a similar profile but smaller uh, so that you can get away with it, with it on smaller drawer fronts. It, it doesn't show very well from this view. Let me go to the cabinet here. Let um, me go to the cabinet level of it, the plan view. I want to zoom in on this. And you can kind of see my little snap points here. Let me turn off my color and turn off the snap points. No different raised panel profiles here. The big one is the one that's showing on the, the doors. The small one is the one that's showing on the drawer fronts. So that's the difference between an A and an A drawer panel. Um, there we go. It's easier to see. So you can see the similar shape. It's just that the drawer front one is smaller. So let me escape back to the job. All thing I haven't mentioned yet is when I hit escape or this blue return arrow, this window pops up every, every time. Um, I always use the escape button because it just bypasses that and just goes right out. So when I'm on the cabinet level, no matter what I'm doing, I can just hit escape two times and it takes me back to the job. If you use the blue return arrow, you'll see that that little window. Whenever you see this, you always want want to hit no uh, on this one. So I, escape bypasses it and automatically selects no. That's why I always just hit, hit escape a couple of times. But but if you see this window, just tap no, and it will uh, back out. If you yes, the only thing it will do is turn the text in this report view. It'll turn the name of that cabinet red. Uh, it's fine. It doesn't hurt anything. The only thing is that in our cut listing process, we use that red as a signifier that that cabinet has been in inspected and, and approved in a, from an engineering standpoint. We've inspected everything you've entered and made sure that it looks like it works. So let's try to avoid selecting yes on that on that selection if you can. Um, now, uh, back to these drawer fronts. Uh, notice, too, that because I selected a raised panel drawer front, now all of the drawer fronts in this room have changed. Uh, we talked about overrides, and I want to override a couple of, of things here really quick. I'm going to come to this first group of cabinets. Now let's say you wanted to have a uh, block front for all of your narrow top drawers and raised panel five-piece drawer fronts for your, your bottom or lighter drawers. Um, the way we would do that is I'm going to right-click on this cabinet, pick section, I could also double click and go to the cabinet level, but um, I'm going to click on this drawer front. Now, from this drawer front, I again will double click. That's going to bring me back into this drawer properties window we talked about earlier. Um, now, from this, though, I can do several things. I can uh, change and open and close the drawer, for number one. I can change the outside edge profile. Sometimes we'll show this here in a minute on a deco panel how to change which edges are profiled depending on what you're doing with that deco. But the two I want to talk about right now are this change and section uh, buttons. The first one I want to do is change, because we're actually going to try to change this to a different drawer front. When I click change, it's going to go to the door catalog. This door catalog's got, I forget the exact number, but it's over a 1,000 doors that are in here. And, and it may take you a really long time to look through everything. So sometimes it makes best sense to come here to the search window and type in what you're after. Um, in this case, I want a block front. So I can just type in block. I could also type in 
B-L-O and then an asterisk, which is a wild card saying anything that starts with B-L-O. And it looks through and finds a whole bunch of different block fronts here, too. So I want the simplicity one in this case. Um, I'm going to pick Naughty Alder with a number one edge. All right, and OK, and then OK again. So it will change that drawer front to a block front. I can then double click on the cabinet adjacent to it, select there to highlight it blue, then double click, and do the same thing here. And I can hit change. Now pick to that block front this recent uh, tab will show me whatever the last 15 drawer fronts I, I selected are, or doors. So the last one I picked is always in the upper left corner. So I'm just going to click there again, the alder and the number one, and say OK. Now we see that this cabinet, I'm going to hit Escape to get off of the sectioning view, and Escape one more time to deselect that cabinet. Now you'll notice that even these other cabinets maintained a raised panel look, these top two drawer fronts have been overridden. We talked yesterday about that hierarchy. When I have an override on a drawer front, I have locked that drawer front down. So now if I go back and change my room and go to my door, I'm not going to do it here, but if I were to go back into this catalog and go to the door page and change all of my doors and drawer fronts to a different wood or a different edge profile um, or a different door style altogether, these two block drawer fronts are not going to change with the room. They have been overridden, so they lock down to the wood, the finish, or excuse me, not the finish, the wood, the door style, and the edge detail um, on that on that drawer front um, because I've overridden those, those items. So uh, that's important to, to know. If you ever do custom overrides like this, make sure that when if you go back in and change your, your room settings that you'll look for your overrides that you have not uh, they the override has, has locked it down and it won't change with any any last minute changes you do to the job. So another thing that's really common on drawer fronts is to come in here uh, and for instance these two uh, wire drawer fronts. Let's say you want in your whole job all of your top drawers to be block fronts um, and your bottom drawers to all be piece, but you want them to match your doors. Notice on these drawer fronts, we've got a narrow rail. On the doors, we have a wider rail on it. So we want these all to match. So in this case, I am going to go up to our catalog and change. So what I'm going to do is instead of a Bainbridge raised panel drawer front, I want a Bainbridge raised panel drawer front with wide rails, the WR. So when I pick that, then I again have to come up here and change these specifications. Now, in this case, let's change it because we're going to wide rails on all of these these, and I want to have that raised panel match the doors, so I'm going to say an A panel instead of that A drawer panel, and let's say finish. Take a second. It's rebuilding all the cabinets after you do that. Okay, notice here now I've got the wide rails, my panel profile matches, my edge profile matches. Again, notice that the top two drawer fronts stayed as block fronts. That's because they had the override on it. So that's okay to do. Um, what I typically recommend to people is for your room level drawer front selection, options it has for you to pick from here. Pick the one that you're going to see most frequently in that room. You, you don't want to pick one that you're only going to have, oh, I'll pick a block front, um, and then there's only one narrow front, and all the rest of the drawers in the room are these wide rails. Then you have to override every drawer except for this one. So I recommend picking room selection to be the, the driver drawer front you're going to see most, most commonly in this room. Now, if I zoom here and pan over, again, notice that these drawer fronts disappeared. So that is, I changed the room to a wide rail drawer front. Again, these drawer fronts can handle that. They're too, they're too narrow to handle it. So I could either go in and right-click override this drawer front to turn it into a block front. I could turn it into a Bainbridge drawer front with the narrow rail. Um, whatever you want to do on those to make those those drawer fronts come back. So I'm going to come back here in this case and set my drawer style back to the narrow rail drawer front. I'll inspect my specification here, not the alder, number one edge, and an A panel, so we're still fine. So all of these drawer fronts now are going to come back, but you'll also notice all of the wall drawers go back to the narrow rail. Um, what you can do in this case is um, let's take let's take your drawer bank as an example here. We're going to override three 
or two of the three drawer fronts. Um, if I right click and section, let's say for instance on this one that we're going to not equalize these drawer fronts. So I'm going to check the equalize height and I'm going to take that center drawer and I'm going to make it slightly less. Um, so I've got to, let's make it a little bigger than that. There we go. So now I have a small, medium, and a large. So what I want to do here is I want to pick my narrow rail as my, my, my base, my default for the room. But I'm going to change the top drawer to a simplicity block front, not the alder with the number one edge. OK, and then OK. So I've overridden my top drawer to have a block front. My bottom drawer, I want to make it so that it matches my doors, though. So I can go to this. There's two ways I can do this now. Um, the first way is like we've showed you under change. But if I go in here to my search tab and type in uh, Bainbridge, and I won't even the whole thing, I'll just type part of it, then an asterisk, and then I want a raised panel. Those are the only three Bainbridge raised panels here, so I want to pick the one with the wide rail on it. I could do that and pick my edge and panel profile and wood type and say OK and then OK. So what I use there is totally custom drawer box or uh, cabinet box there with three independent drawer fronts. Um, now there's another way that, that we could make these drawer fronts be wide rails like that though. Rather than changing the drawer fronts, I could just change the width of the rails. And that's the next button I want to show in here because this next button applies to a whole bunch of different things. So I'm going to right click on this cabinet and say section. Now if I this drawer front, click it, and notice both of them are blue. Um, that's because they're locked to each other, their height is locked. If I uncheck equalize height, that blue becomes independent of the other drawer front. So right click on that drawer front and say properties, or just double click on it. It brings me again to this drawer properties window. Now instead of the change button this time, I want to pick on section door. And this, this button will be used pretty frequently. Um, deco panels, we'll use this on face frames, we'll use it on uh, glass doors, all kinds of things. And those are all the things I want to show you now. So, uh, so if I go to section door, notice I can see all specs of the, the rail widths, um, my edge and panel and inside profiles. It will only allow me profiles that are available for this door style. But I can change, whether it's simplicity or not, I can change the sizes of these parts. I can make those rails be 42 millimeters. Um, and it changes on my picture, then I say OK, and OK again. Then to this drawer here, do the same thing. I'll just double click on that drawer front, section 64, and 64. And then I'll click OK, and OK. So essentially what we've done there is the exact same thing we did on this cabinet, on, well, at least on lower drawer, except for that I just, instead of picking a different drawer front style, I just overrode the, the width of those styles and rails. This here is the method that I typically use. Um, you can use whatever method you like. Um, sectioning compl or complex, you can, you can do a lot of things with it. Let me come up here to this upper cabinet. I'm going to do the same thing. I'll right click on the cabinet, pick section, I'll click on it, highlight it blue. I can double click in that door. And here I'm going to say section the door. I'm going to turn this to a glass door. To do that, if I click in this panel. Notice it's raised panel. If I'm clicked in the background somewhere, nothing's selected on my door. I can, here I can affect my panel details, things like that. But if I click on individual parts, it just shows me whatever I can change on that individual part. In case, I'm going to change my raised panel. I could change it to horizontal grain. Um, there's some issues with doing that on a door this size. but. Uh, a raised panel I can change to a flat panel. In this case, I'm going to turn it to a glass panel. Okay, now I'm going to say OK and OK. So let's see what it does to this cabinet. All right, so now we see that there's glass doors on this cabinet. Uh, we'll also see here, though, is a melamine interior of this cabinet. If you're going to turn it to glass doors, you're most likely going to want a veneer interior. To do that, you go to the log, down to wild cards, and then finished interior. Now I'm going to take that finished interior wildcard, drag it out onto my cabinet, and let go. 
notice something happened. This is cabinet number 13. I can inspect this by going to the reports. Cabinet number 13 has a subassembly called finished interior. That's a card, but I still don't see it having affected anything. So again, check yesterday, uh, wild cards. I want to click on that cabinet and then hit my enter key two times. It will rebuild that cabinet. Now it changes the inside to veneer. So, uh, so bolts are required. I needed to to change the bolt to glass, but also to change the cabinet to a veneer interior. So now what I'm going to do though is I'm going to I'm going to customize these doors even further. I can come in here and let's go back into sectioning this door. Um, I'm going to turn this to a true divided light or a TDL door. Uh, the way that is by using these splits up here. Um, a document in the door catalog, and I'm going to drag this over into the screen real fast to show you this. Um, I've left this P this PDF file with all of you. Um, so if I scroll down through this and I find the door I want, let's get down in here. Into the, there we are, Bain raised panel. On this cabinet, or on this, this picture door, um, you'll notice down here a multi-panel mullion size and a divided light mullion size. And in this case, we're doing a true divided light. We'll come back to this multi-panel mullion here in a minute. Um, but true divided light mullion is 32 millimeters for this particular door style. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this screen back on my other monitor here out of your view. Um, I'm in here and put my mullions in this in 32 millimeter uh, sizes. Now, whenever I put mullions, I want to, to do my horizontals first. Um, so they match my rails. Um, now, this one came in at 19 millimeters. 19 millimeters just happens to be the last one that I, I, that I made. Um, if I pick 32 millimeters, uh, the next time I split a panel, it's going to pick 32 millimeters as a default. If I change that to 60 millimeters and then come down here and split it again, it picks 60 millimeters as my default. So I'm going to delete each of these sections here. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to change this one to 32. By changing that to 32, I have set my default as 32. So now if I delete that, and then let's delete that one. Now what I'm going to do is click in this panel and say horizontal multi-split. I'm in three equal sections. Yeah, that sounds all right. We'll do that. It's my three equal sections. I can click in each of these independently, and notice it says glass, glass, and glass. So now I can put it in a vertical split. This already the last time I did it was 32 millimeters, so I'm OK to continue here. And then I hit OK and OK. Notice real quick, I'm going to come back to this section. Notice it only shows one door here. Um, but my cabinet I've selected has two doors on it. This, again, is a pair of doors. So these two doors are linked together. Now, what I do to one of them happens to both of them. So if I hit OK, now I see that divided light mullion setup show up there. My shelf don't line up with those mullions. I know a lot of people like those too, so you can customize the location of those shelves to do that too. Um, and then let me come back to these doors. Um, I'm going to reset these doors. If I want to reset anything ever, and by this works for an override too. If you went to a cabinet and overrode the drawer fronts we did earlier and you want to set it back to the room default, if I click on it and I pick anything but what I'm selected on here, I'm on pair of doors, so I'm just going to turn that to a door and then go back to a pair of doors. What I just did there is just reset that back to the room level defaults. I cleared my override. So uh, now on this door, what I'm going to do is go back into it, double click, section door. And this time, I'm going to make a little more complex door. I'm going to take this thing. And now again, on my uh, door log, my panel mullion size said 74 millimeters for this particular door style. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make that 74 millimeters. And I can manually slide this up and down to get the look I want, or I can click in one of these. And in this case, let's click here, and we'll just tell it to make that 8 inches. Now what I can do is make this panel a glass panel and leave one a raised panel. And in fact, we could go so far as to put some 30 millimeter mullions in here. That's and that's glass, so I'm okay to split that and split that now, and then say A and OK. And then I have a new custom raised panel and glass combo door. You can customize these however you want. Um, we did one 
just a few days ago. I'll reset that again. I'll come back in. Section door. I'm going to turn this to a glass panel. And again, I'm going to say 32 millimeters, but this time I'm going to change some of these panels. I'll show you here real quick. Um, oops. There we go. Let's go a little bigger then. I'm going to make these like this. Then I'm going to put a divider in there and there. You can custom this however you want. I think you can probably get the idea. Um, you, you can make that that door look like whatever you want. You can drink whatever mullion uh, configurations you want. Now that being said, some of these door styles uh, will not have mullion allowed on them. If I scroll down here, right there's one. The particular profile, the profile is inch, it's over an inch. If I put a, a, a pro and a profile on the other side for a, a divided light mullion, pretty soon I'm I'm almost as wide as my main styles are. It gets really tough to do a TDL door in some styles, so just be aware of, of that. Um, all right, so that is glass doors and TDL doors. Um, we'll go ahead to this cabinet sitting there for right now. Uh, we'll come back to it here in a few minutes. Um, this time go to my back side of my wall. I'm just going to place a deco back here. I want to show you sectioning decos. So I'm going to come here to my objects and to a door and deco. Let's just grab a deco panel. Grab a base deco. And I want to imagine this going on that Wayne's Wayne got paneling on the back of a bar or even on just a, a, in a library or whatever you want to put it on. Um, and I make this thing eight feet wide. Uh, the way we've we've done these, uh, I've seen these up to 14, 15 feet wide. I've seen them that wide, even with a curve to them, where they bow out from the wall on a curved bar back. There's all kinds of things you can do to customize these. We won't really go into into that today, but um, just know that it is possible. Um, on go panel, I want to make uh, some customizations to this to this panel. Now, remember the concept yesterday of of cabinet containers. Um, this I'll call it, is really just a deco. What it consists of is a door with, all, uh, with a cabinet with all of its cabinet parts hidden, so all we see is the door. So we treat it just like any cabinet, though. If I want to customize this door, I can click here and double-click and say section this door. Now, what we'll do in this case, um, again, remember on that door style, our mid mid or our mullions were, were 74 millimeters. Um, if I split this, notice it back to 32. That's where I was at before. So if I change that to 74, now my default is 74. So if I delete that now, I'll come back into here and say multi-split. And let's split this into, I don't know, let's see what five panels looks like. Okay, so five panel wide wainscot deco. So what I'm also going to do here is make a wide bottom rail on this one. Now, we calculate these typically. Our toe kick is 110 millimeters. Uh, we want this to be, well, right now it's 64 millimeters, so we want to add 110 millimeters to that, so it's 174. Um, that will put us, if I, if I put OK here and OK here, now we see that deco panel. Now I have an adjacent cabinet to it, my toe kick ends here. What's left of this, or if I wrap base molding around this, this deco, what's left is the same width as this, what you see on the styles. So if it's out to the room, then we see that there. Again, because this is a cabinet, if I want to, it's really a deco, but Cabinet Vision treats it as a cabinet. I can right-click and section from the room level also. So on this deco, the other thing I want to do is play with its edge profiles, because I really don't want an edge profile on the bottom. I want this to sit square against the ground, so I'm just going to turn off the bottom edge profile. Notice we see that edge profile is missing there now. If I looked at this in 3D, it's profile running around on the, the left and right sides and the top, but the bottom is left square. That information does transfer to uh, manufacturing, so we know exactly what you want. The other thing you can do on these, if I came in here um, to section this door, if you had corbels that wanted to sit on the back of this, um, I'm going to delete these panels in here. And I'm going to re-divide this, and this time I'm going to divide it into three equal sections. 
what I'm going to do here is make these panels extra big. Let's just go five inches on these panels. The other thing I can do here, this, the read did that is so that I could put a great big fat corbel that's on top of that of that mullion. So uh, I could also do things like customize the size of these panels. I could lock that width. Change this one to be 47. We'll lock that width. And then we've got this great big one in the middle, which you may or may not like. But the point is, you can customize these however you want. If I say okay, okay, there's my there's my deco panel. Now I've got a big wall mullion that I can place my my tiles and rails on, um, or my cool on, excuse me. Uh, and the other thing I can do if I picked a tall deco panel thing, if I made this extra wide, I could come to this deco section door. I could split this. Now again, these pick my 32 millimeters, so I want to go back to 74, 74, and then I change these to whatever I want. Uh, a lot of people will try, will take deco panels, tall deco panels, on the side of their oven cabinet and get their their mullions to match up with mullions on the face of the adjacent cabinet. So you can you can do all that stuff. It's just fine. So let me go back over here to the face of this wall. Um, so that's sectioning deco panels. Uh, let's see. Talk to edge profiles on those deco panels. Let's look at face frame cabinet real quick because that same concept applies here. Um, it's a little bit different in cabinet vision in our catalog than what you'll see anywhere else in cabinet vision because of the way we have it set up. I've just put a face frame cabinet on here and I'm going to go to the cabinet. Now, if I'm that you, it says it's a false front over here. It's a little bit misnomer. The only reason we have that selected as false front is if I pick it as a if the door, it's going to have hinges on it. If I pair doors, obviously it'll be two different ones. But if I pick a false front, I can override this cabinet. I'm going to come here and change this cabinet to a door style called face frame. It'll be just a, a overlay face frame, but the way that vision treats it is as a door. So this cabinet already has it, so I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to push cancel. The nice thing about this, though, is I can change that face frame however I would like. I can come in here and section that face frame so I can make my rails, left, left uh, styles, top rail, bottom rail, whatever I want to do. I could add a mid stump to this, um, and I can make it, in this case, whatever I want because it's a face frame, and I can, I can position this however I'd like and say OK and OK. So now I have a a mid rail in there. I can. Um, we'll show interior sectioning here in just a second. But I could. I can change my shelves so that I have a fixed shelf behind this mullion. Um, we'll get to that here in just a minute, though. One other thing I want to show you on a face frame is a card that's really commonly used with face frames. If I face frames or wild cards modifications and down to face frames, a face frame balance. If I this on the cabinet, we'll see what happens here. Again, nothing happens. I hit it two times on my on my keyboard. Now notice I've got an arch on this on this face frame. I also have a bunch of new sidebar parameters. So now I can cycle through different I think running kind of slow now I think because of this meeting that's going, but um, the idea though I can customize different arches that are in there. I can change the overall that part, the the centimeters here in this case is how big is at the top of this. So if I customize that to 64 millimeters, you'll see the top of the arch get larger. If I customize the overall rail width, and by width it doesn't mean left to right in this case. It means if you're looking at just that individual rail by itself. So if I change that to 150 millimeters, you'll see that arch change. Um, so you can customize those however you want. Um, that's just a common wild card to be used on, on face frames. Um, sectioning works exactly the same as an cabinet. So right click section. So the section editor here, I can extend the face frame down past the bottom of the cabinet. I could also extend it to the to the left, say if I want to describe it into the wall, if I wanted to add a half of an inch to the face frame, describe it into the wall, I can do that instead of putting a filler there. I just use my face frame as filler. Now one thing to watch when you do that, notice that 
uh, it just moved the face frame bigger. That style stayed at the same width it was before. So if I came back in here to section this, that's still 38 millimeters. What I really would want, though, here is probably 50 millimeters to add that 12 millimeter to it. So I'll do that. So now I scribe off the half inch that's there. I'm left with an inch and a half that matches the style on this cabinet. Um, you get the idea here that you can you can change all kinds of things on the face of a cabinet um, within its doors or, or on deco panels. Now inside a cabinet, you can do the same sorts of things. And we kind of brushed over this briefly yesterday, but you can click any part in this cabinet and change what it is. I can change it from an adjustable shelf to a fixed shelf. In this case, let's put some glass shelves in here. Um, Gloves are something that we get asked all the time if we supply these. We do not, typically. Uh, you'll see them kind of right there in the drawing. Um, the real switch something to a glass shelf is to maintain the shelf pin boring that you see in the cabinet. If I delete the shelves, it will get rid of the shelf boring inside. So yeah. by putting a glass shelf in, you're telling us you want it bored for shelves, but we're not supplying any shelves to go with it. Um, there are some wild cards that are real commonly used with this kind of a situation as well. They go back to wild cards. In this case, I want to go to cabinet adjustable shelves. And let's say wood frame glass shelves. Um, so this adds a wood frame to the glass shelves. Shelves must be glass to begin with. It the note, uh, kind of explains here what you need to do. In this two different things here, frame glass shelf will just be a wood frame. An SWE has a solid wood edge on the front of these wood frame glass shelves. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to drag this out and let go. Now, nothing happened until I hit enter two times. Now the shelves show up, and I also see a new sidebar parameter, solid edge width. If I come to this cabinet, let's go in 3D here, see the wood frame glass shelves in there and the front nosing, an inch half nosing on it. Notice sidebar parameters are visible in any view, in 3D section, any of these isometric views. You'll see the 3D or sidebar attribute, change the sidebar attribute to 64 millimeters, and you see the nosing get bigger on those shelves, or I can make it small, or 25 millimeters. Just make it a little beefier than what it would be without that edge on it, but however you want to customize it. So, so that's one thing on the inside. Um, I think yesterday we briefly talked about rollout trays. Let me change my view back to a wire frame. And I'm going to go to a couple of cabinets and put some different rollout trays in them. The cabinet, let's right click and section here. And I'll go this time instead of section face, I want to pick section interior. So I'm in here and just change these to roll out trays. All right. If I try to click that and drag it, we'll see what happens here. Oh, it did move. Sometimes what you'll see is it won't let you move, and that's because the gaps in between them um, are to equalize, and so it won't let you move them. But in this case, it did. So I'm going to set this one down at the bottom. And then let's equalize the height and equalize the height between those two so it centers the other one. Notice in here uh, that rollout tray goes right to the edge of the cabinet. See, that won't be the case. If there's hinges on the side of a cabinet, there needs to be a spacer in that cabinet. You don't have to remember to put a spacer in it, but then it hasn't, again, had a reason to reevaluate things. If I hit my Enter key two times, just like a wild card, it will rebuild this cabinet. The other way to rebuild a cabinet, though, is to just double-click it and go to the cabinet level. And notice now I see the spacers in there. If I exit back out of the cabinet, now the spacers are there. It just needed a reason to rebuild itself. Um, so now it's got spacers on it. If that's if the cabinet only had hinges on one side, change this from a pair of doors to a single door, it's now hinged on the left side. Now if I double-click enter, it reevaluates gets rid of the spacer on the non-hinge side, so you get the maximum space out of your rollout tray. So so that's a, a standard rollout tray here. Um, there are a couple of other things we can do. I'm going to come back in, right-click section, and go to section interior, and I'm going to change this rollout tray to a rollout shelf. Now, a roll shelf is essentially a flat shelf with a solid wood edge, an inch and a half nosing on it with a little recessed finger pole under it. That's for a printer stand or a mixer stand, or whatever you'd like to put on there. Um, so that, that's one thing you can customize. Um, let me go back to a rollout tray, though. I'm going to change this bottom rollout tray to a totally different kind of rollout tray. It's still a rollout tray, but I'm going to customize it. So to do that, I'm going to double-click. Just like in a sectioning mode on a door, I'm going to double-click um, this yellow.
yellow in this case. It's yellow for interiors, blue for exteriors. I'm going to double click here, though, on the yellow rollout tray. It brings up my rollout tray um, properties here, and I can change which type of rollout I want. In this case, let's pick a one with the finger pull on it. Um, so now you a finger pull show up in the front of that rollout tray. I can also pick one that, let's say, a scooped side. And say OK. If that drawer front got, or that the rollout got bigger, I'm going to go to the cabinet level and spin this around. There's a scoop side rollout. The idea, you can change those rollouts however you like. Um, another thing you can do with rollouts, if I right click and section this, go back to my interior, let's go to this rollout, and I'm going to double click. I can edit the drawer box here. Now, what I'm looking at here is a top-down view of this rollout tray. So just sectioning any door or drawer front, I can section a drawer box as well. I can put dividers in here. I can position them manually, or I can type in what I want them to be. Let's go a little narrower on this one, and then I'm going to put in multi-split. Let's go three sections in front. So OK and OK. I see those dividers in my cabinet. Double-click it to go to the cabinet level. You see how that drawer is configured. You can you can customize a lot of trace. Uh, incidentally, you can also do drawer, for, drawer boxes the same way. I'll right click here. The difference on drawer boxes is you go to the interior. That's opening as far as the system knows. I need to section a drawer box by doing its face. So I'm going to go to the drawer front, double click, and here the drawer box tab, and I can say section drawer box. And again here, do the same thing um, and section it however I want. I can. Do it like this and put a single door. However you want to divide your drawer up is fine. Um, and to us, it prices correctly, and, and we know where to put those those uh, drawer, drawer dividers uh, the way you have them. Um, let's see here. Um, that kind of covers the sectioning of cabinets. There's all kinds of things you can do with cabinets. You can make big, wide, cubby cabinets with lots of spaces in them. Um, know that the more internal dividers you have, the more expensive a cabinet gets. It's more complicated to put together. Obviously, it takes more material, but it's more complicated to assemble that cabinet. So the more of those you have, the more expensive it gets. Um, kind of common sense, but um, just be aware of that. Uh, there are ways. Uh, occasionally, we get somebody that asks us to build cabinets. It doesn't work super well in a row box, um, and there's really not much sense in it because you end up with such tight reveals anyway. Um, but on a uh, face frame lay, I'm going to delete these two. And let's just drop a cabinet box in here. Um, I just want to see what you can do with this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining this, but I just want you to see what kind of things you can do. And let's go a little bigger than that. This time, I'll change this cabinet. I'm going to override it to be a, a beaded inset cabinet. My face frame on it now. But now what I'm going to do is section this cabinet. Now, in this case, I want to delete everything that's inside of it. If I have this selected and I hit delete, it'll just delete those doors. But if I have anything selected and I hit delete, it'll erase everything on this cabinet other than the case parts and the face frame. What I want to do here is I'm going to just do some quick sectioning. Um, just see what, what can be done. Um, I'm going to customize the widths of these and lock it. And we'll call that one. Same and lock it. Now the center section, I'm going to divide it like this. I'm going to turn this to a pair of doors. And let's turn this one split into three drawers. Then an interior, and put some vertical dividers in here. In this case, I'm going to change these to double dividers, and I'm going to tell them to be boxed dividers, so it splits them out away from each other. Double divider, boxed. And then this side, I'll put a couple, let's see, I'm going to do two things in here. I'm going to tell it at first to put two adjustable shelves, but then I'm going to turn this one into a rollout tray and slide to the bottom. And then I'm going to put a new one in and call it Rollout Shelf. 
and leave one adjustable shelf in there. This is really a goofy cabinet, but I um, just want you to see that pretty I can section and, and create my own cabinet. Again, the drawer front we have selected it doesn't work on top drawers. But you see all those parts and pieces that are in here. Um, and one great big gang built beaded inset cabinet. Beaded inset cabinets are, are nice when you when you get them gang built like this. It's just a lot easier for installation. You don't see the joint between face frames, all of those kinds of things. But um, I guess it's that kind of to you. You can customize a cabinet however you want. Um, most of the time, you want to use a cabinet straight out of the catalog. It, you only want to do what I just illustrated here. Um, once you're comfortable with things, but also uh, when that cabinet doesn't exist, otherwise you don't want to you don't want to turn a, a base full height door into a three drawer bank uh, when a three drawer bank already exists. Just just delete your base full height door and drop a three drawer bank in um, instead of sectioning something into something that exists already. So uh, the nice thing about whatever you do sectioning wise is all of the pricing is account accounted for in all of those parts. So you, you don't have any modifications or anything like that you have to do to this cabinet for pricing. It's just priced the way you see it on your screen. So let me come back over here. Um, let's see. I think that at this point, cut all of the sectioning that we want to, we want to talk about today. Um, there are a couple of other things that um, I want to talk about really quickly. Uh, that come up periodically, but they're not super common. One of them is shaping a wall. Um, there are a new wall in here. I'm going to click on that wall and go to its elevation. Oh, it didn't even go to it, right? Let me go here. Wall elevation. If I right-click on a wall in elevation mode, I can say Edit Shape. Now, these tools, are, they take a little bit of getting used to. When you learn them, they're, they're really easy to use. Um, but if you think of these tools, each of these yellow points, the push pin and the dotted purple and white line um, or black line uh, as a rubber band around those uh, push pins. If I add a point, I can place it there on that rubber band and stretch that rubber band where I want and just place it there. And I'm going to put another one over here. Um, and let's see, this one I'm going to do kind of a, a weird setup on. Let me do it last. Now it's all, all uh, good and nothing straight here, so I can then move, move reference points uh, or move points in relation to another point. So what I want to do to use this tool is I'm going to click on one point. And see how it turns it kind of a light green. That is my reference point. If I now right click on another point, this is saying in relation to the first point, my horizontal offset. Let's call it 1800, and my vertical. I want it to be zero because I want it to be on the same level. So there, and now I have a straight line. Now I can left click here to set that as a reference point. Oops. Left click, then right click here. Let's make that horizontal offset zero. Vertical, let's go down minus 900. Left here to set as a reference point. Right click here. Horizontal, let's go minus 1,000 and vertical zero. Um, Left set that as a reference point. Right click here. Horizontal, say zero. Vertical, let's go minus 500. Now I'll set one as a reference point by left clicking and right click here. Horizontal is fine, but vertical I want to say zero. Now that I made whatever alterations I want to this wall, I can say yes. And now I've shaped that wall. So for walls, for arched openings, in walls, um, full height walls that then transition into peninsula or island walls. That's how you would do that is uh, to shape that wall. Again, you do it from the elevation view. You right click and pick edit shape on that on that wall. So that really is to that concept. Um, I'll delete that wall. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to open a new job. I'm going to close this one. By the way, get get in the habit of when you're done with one job, um, obviously save, but don't just go open a new job. Sometimes I've seen it uh, cause some problems for cabinet vision. Get in the habit of always clicking close first. In this case, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and save it. Um, okay, I'm going to open, uh, let's see, let's go to this one. 
talk about moldings and countertops for, for a minute. Um, so we've got a little a little test set up here. Once it opens, there we go. Um, so we've got some base cabinets and some upper cabinets, some appliance cabinets. It's just a real generic layout. Um, this is really simple because my cabinets are the same. The base cabinets are the same height, and all my uppers are on the same plane. So it's really really simple. Um, I'm going to go to plan view, and we're going to talk about the countertops and molding here for a second. Let's do countertops first. Um, again, remember, uh, we talked about this, uh, I can't remember, day one or day two, but um, when you do your countertop molding from these two buttons, these two buttons are for graphic rendering purposes only. If they need to be part of your order, you have to go to the reports view and order entry and find your molding and drag and drop them on as ghost items like this right here. But so right here I have a crown base or a crown twelve and a crown base L mitered. So we'll put that here in just a minute. But let's start with our countertops in this case. So I'm gonna go to the tops mode. Now a lot of time countertops there's a lot of details here that I don't want. So change my my profile or my detail setting that was too low. Uh, there you go. That's a good one for countertops. Um, I like to be able to just see the bare bones here. I also this is a, a time when I always per, turn on my snap points. So now I have some uh, finite points to to connect. So a um, couple of important concepts here on countertops. Um, start building. If I say new top, notice these are similar to that rubber band, the shaping the wall tool that I showed you. Add, add points, delete points, um, reference point, those kind of things. If I add uh, countertop here, um, it's going to not be what I really want. If you notice here this little dotted red line around our peninsula, dotted line uh, denotes that that's where, that's the wall I'm attaching these countertops to. If I click in front of a wall, it moves that dotted red line to wherever I click. So what I want to do is always make sure and only draw a wall on the place where I'm selected. And now I can do my countertop along this wall. The reason that is, if I go, if I selected right here on my peninsula and I draw all my countertops on, that countertop is only attached to this peninsula wall. It will only show in the elevation view of, of this peninsula wall. If I go to the elevation view of any of these other walls, it won't show. So sometimes people will draw their countertops on and then call me and say, hey, why doesn't this countertop show? It's because you didn't attach it to the right wall. So in this, let's just click right here to start and say new top. And let's just add some points here. Um, and I'm going to put in kind of rough to start with. Um, let's see, let's go there and there. And then notice I've still got a hold of this rubber band. I right click to release. So now what I want to do is move for for overhangs or offsets. So I can move individual points. In this case, I want to just use move line parallel. So I can grab that symbol and just move it however far I want. In this case, we'll just type in a, um, let's just go an inch and a half. Um, oops, I'm in millimeters. That'll put past my doors and a, a overhang past that. Um, the other thing I can do here is set my edges. So I can say backsplash I want along this back edge. Um, I want a profiled edge along that edge. I want a butt edge, let's see, let's do a finished edge here and an unfinished edge here, how about that? And I have to escape, just to, to out of this mode and it says save new shape and I want to say yes. So now I look at this in 3D, else I'm on a, a detail level that doesn't show countertops. Uh, I could either go to a higher detail, there's, there's that countertop. If I was on that same detail, though, and I just wanted to tweak it, I could right-click in the background, pick Properties, Layers, and let's see, Countertops is one there, and let's put our Backsplash turned on also. I don't really care about the build-up on them. Let's turn our molding on. There it is. So now I got Countertop. Um, so in order to put this everywhere else, I'm going to come back in here to my Tops mode. In this case, let's go to this peninsula wall, and we'll do the same thing. I'm just going to kind of cruise through this really quickly here. Um, 
This is a tool that takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, you'll want to get in and play around with it. Um, it. It is a little squirrely when you first try it. I'm going to do something different with this one, too. I'm going to arc a line. I'm just going to bend that line out. Um, and I can all radius the point if I want it. I want to go there. I can put a, a, a half radius on that outside corner. Um, and then I can tell it to do a profiled edge. Actually, it's selecting this line there. It's just something kind of kind of fishy, but I'll go ahead and let it just go here and say save new shape, yes. Um, and there's my countertop. Notice in this view, it's it's showing uh, the same color as the cabinets. Um, I could come here to this colors button and to my countertop. Actually, it's kind of showing sorry anyway, but let's just try and see what it does here. There it goes. Now it stands out a little bit better. Um, if I go to render mode and texture, most of you don't don't show textures to clients anyway. But um, for curiosity's sake, you can you can start getting some nice looking renderings. Um, you can also turn off. If I right click in properties. Let's see, there we go. I can let's see enable outlines on filled views. So if I say OK unchecked the enable outlines and said okay. Let's see. There it goes. So it got rid of all my cartoon kind of lining, but I see you can do some nice looking renderings if you want to. Um, but times people don't you just want to do a line rendering. We'll get into printing this here in, in a few minutes, but um, all right, so back to this view. So you get the idea with countertops though. So essentially I would do that repeat that same step all the way around the room. Um, stopping in the corners, let me turn off these, see, notice all these all these white dots again, it's a lot slower moving around, so I, I turn them off whenever I can. So oh, there, that's a lot faster. Um, you want up in your corners so that then you can say, oh, I'm this wall, now I'm going to add countertops to this wall, and now I'm going to add countertops to this wall. Okay, so that's countertops. Uh, molding operates the same way. If I go to molding, the same sort of the red line will show up wherever I click. Sometimes it's a little harder to see because you've got cabinets right over the top of it, so you need to be careful where you put these. Um, in this case, let's pick our crown molding. Um, and I'm just getting new molding. Again, I'm going to turn my snap points back on. You know what? I'm going to back out here real quick. Let me go back to my molding. I'm going to go to a lower detail here. Yeah, there we go. I just wanted really simple cabinets to be showing here. Um, so new molding. Now I'm going to snap all this. Okay, now the question comes. We talked about but, uh, uh, corners because I'm going to transition somehow to this other wall. Now what gets tricky here is that I don't want to just continue around this. I suppose I could. Um, it'll make it when I look at this elevation view of, of this wall number one, that look at its elevation, I'll see the return side of all of this crown molding along these walls. So I typically don't go all the way across. Typically what I'll do is come where mid one on this angle cabinet, and I'm just going to right click to let it go. I'm going to fine tune this. So I'm going to say reference point. I'm going to left click to set that as a reference point and right click here. Um, I know a five degree angle, so I can just make sure both of those are equal to each other. Now what I'm going to do is the same thing as far as setting our overhang for our countertops. I'm going to do the same thing here with my with my crown molding. Now the difference here is that um, in this in both cases, really the I'm I attach this molding. Um, or the countertops to the front of the case. So I want to outset that from the case to overhang the doors. Now, if I did that on the front of this, if I went out, our doors are 22 millimeters thick, and I want to, say, hang another 22 millimeters past that. So let's go, um, now let's not go that far. Let's go only 10 millimeters past it. We'll say 32 millimeters. Now, on the side of a cabinet, though, I don't have a door there. So here I would just go 10 millimeters. Whatever I am on the front, less thickness of, of my doors. So um, I'm just going to escape and say 
yes, that's okay. So there it placed my crown molding. Now, that crown molding is going to, again, I'm on a really low level, so it doesn't show the crown molding. There I see it. Um, the crown molding is going to snap to whatever soffit height I have on this wall. So here I have 76 millimeters, 3 inches. It snapped right to that height. Now, uh, one of the problems I have here, you see how I you see the return side here. This is what I was talking about as far as if I were to have continued that crown molding through the corner and over. I like to go a little bit on the corner, and then what I'll do is on this side, I'll do the same thing and, and overlap the, or meet them in the middle um, when I do that. But uh, the problem with this crown um, is, is probably pretty up there in the elevation drawings is that I'm too high for my ceiling. The other thing to notice here is I've got a crown base and a crown molding on this on this drawing showing. Um, they're going to be two separate parts that you'll order. In my report view, I've got crown 12 and crown base L miter. This crown base L miter is exactly what we're seeing right here, but this is crown 11, not a crown 12 coming off of it. Um, so I want to change that. Now the question is how do I change it, right? Um, if I go back if, to this view and I try to click on that molding, I'm just clicking on cabinet that's below the molding. Let me select that, that molding here. So I have to go back to my molding view and make sure I'm on the crown molding view. If I had light balance and baseboard and crown in the same view, it will only let me pick whichever molding I've selected here. So what I'm going to do here is come back here and click on that molding somewhere, and it highlights the path of my molding. If I right-click and say Properties, though, here I'll change the elevation of it. Um, if it's something different than what my soffit height is. Um, but also do things like change the profile from this drawing. Now, in this case, I just have crown base, or crown in with a crown base L ATT, or crown base L miter, um, as one piece just because it's easy to, to render. Um, so I have a crown base, or crown 12 with a crown base L. Um, do that. This is actually what I have on the job order. So if I did that and we went to our elevation view, that's more like what I want in the scale of a job this size. Um, now, in this crown molding that I've selected here, though, I can't change this reveal, vertical reveal of where this crown molding is placed on that crown base. If I wanted to do that, though, um, it's an extra step in the process, but it's not, not too hard to do. If I go back to my molding, I'm going to left click on my molding to highlight it, then I'll right click and say properties. This time, instead of my crown, uh, crown base and crown combo, I'm just going to pick crown base. So let me scroll through here until we find, there we go. So this is just my L shaped crown base, right? Um, now I'm just change that and say, okay. So now all I've got on there is crown base. But now what I can do is come back at this point. Wait, I'm going to set my detail low again. Um, that might be a little too low. Let's see. Oh, I need to be in my molding mode. That's why. Let's go back here to low. There we go. Now if I my snap points back on. Now notice I've got my this pink line here is my uh, my crown that I've attached. Now I can add new molding to that, just like an installer would put on crown base. Now I can apply additional molding over the top of my crown base. Like that. I'm going to right click and escape, save new shape, yes. Now what I want to do is click on this molding and right click, properties. Again, it jumps to my default, which is a crown and crown base combo. But in this case, I want to scroll up and say, just find the crown molding I want. Um, and these are in any sort of order. I wish we could get them in alphabetical order, but for whatever reason, Cabinet Vision does them however they want. Um, so here I'm having a hard time finding my Crown 12. It's probably right under my nose. There it is. There's my Crown 12. Now, now the uh, way I set this on, let's go back here to the medium view. There we go. Crown is at the same level as my crown base. So now, though, I can go back to my plan view molding and click on my crown molding. If I right-click properties, or I can let's say we want to add, add an inch quarter, 32 millimeters. Now nah, it's not that far. Let's just add an inch, 25 millimeters, to it. I can come here and see it's still a little bit too high, so I can change that and only be five eighths of an inch or half an inch or whatever I need to be. So. 
the only way we can customize that crown to base relationship is by putting them on as two separate uh, entities. So I come here to 3D, and I put my crown in there. Obviously, I've only put it on the one wall. Um, with with crown building, also that you want to do is just like walls, you always want to draw a wall from the left to the right. On crown molding, you always want to start on the left and work your way to the right around a room. Um, if you go the opposite way, it can sometimes put your crown molding on backwards, and it'll, it'll be real obvious to you that it's wrong. It sticks into your cabinet instead of out of your cabinet, so it, it looks really funny. But um, but that's what to to be careful of there. So okay, so that's the basic rundown on the countertops and molding. That really doesn't do it much justice. Um, we're not going to have time to cover much more than that. Um, more questions about the molding, and once you get in playing with it, uh, give me a call and we can we can talk about that. Um, uh, I want to talk about reports and and bid center items. So one really quick, we just to to reiterate the countertops and molding. We put this countertop and this countertop on. We put some molding around. Again, those don't go to any sort of pricing. So if I go to my reports view, in this case I had previously put on crown 12 and a crown base L. So those are pricing, and I put on X number of lengths that I need for this room or whatever. Um, these go to price. The, the molding and countertops drawn in your drawings uh, through the, the F4 and 5 tools, tops and molding tools, not price. So, all right. So, uh, let's, right where we're on this job, I'm going to go uh, to reports. And there's several things that you may be interested in this in this screen. For uh, the first one is your bid center, obviously to get your pricing. The second one is your report center. We'll also talk here in a minute about wall elevations. That's a really handy tool for those of you who do who do drawings in in CAD mode. Um, start at the top here and work our way down. Um, no order entry, so let's go to the bid center. So when I go to the report center, I can go to the bid center, and it gathers up all the information, looks at all the parts and pieces, how much finish, and the type of finish you've selected, and, and calculates the cost of this job. So um, in version 8, we've added the add-ons and things, so all of the materials cost, everything is there. This price is your list price, so whatever your, your individual dealer multiplier is, um, you just multiply it against this, and that gives you your dollar amount. Um, under tables, there's a couple of things you might do here. In this case, um, let's say you, you drew this job. Um, it's drawn, so you can take this drawing discount here. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and click on that one for now and say OK. So drawing it, it, it credited that much on it. It's not very much, but on a big job, it starts to add up. So um, the other thing you can do is go to the reports view here. Um, this will be the the printout that we want you to print from your machine before submitting an order. Always print this page from yours so we know what your system is pricing it. I have changes to my system periodically, and so I may get a slightly different price than this, but I want to see what yours prices it as. So here you can you can type in what your dealer multiplier is and then just do the calculation, 10,301 times whatever your dealer multiplier is equals your wholesale price. Now. Notice on here the freight cost is blank. Um, before you make any revisions to this, it's always best to calculate your freight first. So this job has 34.13 freight units. So the way to calculate your freight is to go to this report. There's three different reports you have here. The first one is the, the freight worksheet. This sheet will explain to you how this cost breakdown works. So if I click in here um, and I have 34 units, I look at a mileage chart to see what my additional cost per unit is, multiply the two together, and then we're going to add the minimum freight cost. That will give us a total freight cost. So that mileage chart is right here. So if I go to this and pick any town along, along the way here, um, call, uh has this set up because we do a, a fairly regular run to Colorado, at least, at least once or twice a week usually. Um, so we can typically get you on with, with other loads. Um, if you've got a small job, we can, we can fit it on. So in that case, you would say, well, I'm less than 50 freight units. Um, so I'm going to take, uh, this is my own freight, so I'm going to take wherever I'm headed to in, in Colorado. I could say Silverthorne, and we'll just say it's $273 um, as a minimum. Then it's $18 per freight unit after 
after that. So if I come here, then I would just calculate that out. So 34 times the 18 plus the 243, whatever it was, and I'd type that freight amount in right here. Um, those of you in Nevada, we don't have a regular run going there yet, and so um, at this point, it's just the cost of running the truck uh, for you. Uh, so it's, it's going to be best if we can combine jobs uh, when, when they go your way, but um, eventually we'll get enough going that way that, that smaller jobs will will be subsidized by, by larger jobs. They'll help each other out, I guess you'd say. Um, so, so this is your pricing sheet. Again, once you fill this out, always fill out the information, print it, and then sign at the bottom and submit this uh, via fax or email. I prefer email if you can. Just scan it to PDF and send that in to us with your final order um, just so we can confirm the pricing you're getting out of your system. Uh, one thing that's new on this page that many of you that have used it before have probably not seen is the version. Now this tells you when we updated. So this is Cabinet Vision 8.0.142 and it's Davis Mills uh, catalog dated January 9th. So um, this lets us know if you've updated your catalog. If we send out updates, it's best for you to update as soon as you can. Um, it'll get you bug fixes and additional door things, but also keeps everything up to date and functioning properly. So uh, just, just remember to update whenever those updates come out. Um, let's see. We're going to be time here, I'm afraid, so I want to uh, uh, talk about a couple of things. Um, just to make sure that everybody's clear on, on how this order process works. Uh, the, the price we're seeing here, again, is our our, whole, our list price. You want to multiply it out to get your, your wholesale price. Um, once you submit this report to us, you all will need to save this vision document and email it as well. And you can email it to either me or Mark at, at this point. Uh, we both are receiving them. Um, submit this report and your cabinet vision file. The other things we would need from you is any door samples that are required, which uh, by door samples, I mean anything other than a simplicity job. If it's a simplicity door with simplicity woods, um, a simplicity or express finish, um, and standard simplicity or no distressing on it, those are okay to do without a door sample. All other instances we require a door sample. Um, even on the simplicity ones, though, I recommend doing a door sample. It's it's in your best interest to do that. I know it costs a little bit of money, but um, but your door library will grow. Plus, be able to confirm that that's really what you want. Um, that your client's able to see it um, in a in a full door sample. Um, there are a bunch of PDF reports that I've left with everyone, um, and they'll also be in the printed catalog. The uh, those PDF reports, um, there's several of them I wanted to show you here. Um, the first one I will show you is the color sample form. Um, this form is what you'll want to enter uh, about every time you order a color sample. Um, sometimes you'll you'll just want to get an updated color block. Uh, you may want one in the simplicity or harmony lines, so you'll you'll check the, the simplicity or harmony or express box here. That tells us the size of sample you want. Um, if it's a color one, there are bigger, like 10-inch blocks. Um, the other ones will be the size that go in your your full boxes that we've given you. Um, just check this box here, additional updated standard color. Um, you want to specify here the wood species and color and that kind of information. Uh, there's different categories of color matches here. Some of them you have an old door or color block of ours. Uh, if it's if it's a yes number or an old three-digit number, those are all outdated, so they need to be reformulated into the current finished product that we use. So um, this this is only to, and you'll see down here in kind of the fine print, but um, it's it's to just reformulate it. We're just going to mix up the same amount of pigment pigments in it. It's hard because what you're looking at has aged and. and um, what we're doing new will not age, so that color may vary a little bit. If you need it to match it exactly, then you're more down into this custom color match um, sort of a arena. So okay, that kind of uh, kind of gives you the rundown here. You can also specify if you want distressing um, on a color block, but but always fill this out. Um, you can you can fill it out uh, by hand and then scan and 
fax it or email it, whatever you'd like to do, um, but use this form uh, for your color samples. So uh, the other, let me find the other form here for you, is a door sample order form. Um, same thing for this. When you go to order a door sample for a job, you want to fill this form out. So you can specify your door dial. And now these entry here will coincide with me this real fast. I'll come back here to my room setting. When I go to my catalog and to my door selection, style in this case is a Bainbridge raised panel. So here in door style, I would write Bainbridge raised panel. Style and rail profile. It's actually inner profile is what it calls here, so it's a B. Your panel profile is an A. Your outer profile or your edge detail is a number one. Uh, then you can specify header panel up charges, those kind of things. Um, and then the same thing for your drawer front. For, this is all for the door sample. Then you can specify the wood, the case layout, finish, all those things, uh, plus your distressing. So uh, I do encourage people, there's a couple of you that that always use purchase order numbers. I would encourage all of you to use purchase order numbers. Those PO numbers will uh, help in our our bookkeeping records, but also in yours. It will uh, in your invoice. You'll be able to see which door sample it was that you're being billed for. So I just recommend using purchase order numbers whenever you can. Um, so that's the door sample form. So once you've once you've gone through and you've ordered a color sample, we've matched it, and then you say, okay, we're ready for a door sample now. So we, you submit the door sample form, we build that. That goes back to you. At that point, then you will be submitting your vision electron file, the CVJ file that you save on your hard drive. Um, not just not the drawings of it, but with the actual file. Um, the other thing we need is your bid center report. We talked about a minute ago, printed off and and faxed or emailed um, this screen right here. Um, any required door samples to be sent back, and then all of a 50% deposit. Um, there's something on here that just explains right here that we want a 50% deposit. You can exclude the freight. You can pick that up on the back end. Some people include half of the freight, too. It's up to you, um, however you want to do it, but um, don't have to include the freight in that 50%. Uh, then once we receive all, all of the, that information, and the deposit, uh, then we're able to schedule a job and go from there. And that job then becomes a job order. So before it becomes a job order, we do uh, production services where where you would submit this order to either me or Mark at this point, and we would we would go through uh, your job and kind of proofread for you and help see if we can see any mistakes or mis misentered type items. Um, drawer fronts or, you oh, hey, you forgot to order your crown molding and your toe kick or whatever it is. So uh, that that service, there, there are some people that will submit job orders and have never, we've never seen it before. And um, that's fine if your order's, if your order's clean. Uh, if if you're a little bit about, about getting it exactly accurate, uh, by all means, call us and let us look through your order before you submit a price to a client or or uh, turn it in as a final order. Um, that's the, the ordering process. Um, after a job goes, there's one other little step in the mix, and that's a work order. Um, if, you, if you have a uh, mistake on the job, either you ordered it wrong, um, if, we, if we made a mistake in building it and you get a cabinet that's not what you expected, uh, if your installer cut your crown molding and you just short by one stick of crown molding, whatever it is, an after-the-fact job add, you want to use a work order form, and that also in your uh, live forms that we've sent you. Um, it looks something like this. Um, you can fill this out, um, send to us, and we'll we'll process that. Typically, uh, if you want, you can you can draw it in cabinet vision um, and get your price. Uh, but most of the time, people just send this work order form into us, and then we tell you a price. If you submit this form with a purchase order number on it, though, we're going to just build it. Uh, the you need a price, submit it with a purchase order number that says for price only or for bid only, uh, request for quote, something to that effect. Um, don't get us a work order though, and and wait back on a price because if we get a work order form, we assume that it's a time sensitive issue, so we just start on it immediately. So just be aware of that. Um, it happened to price 
a work order on your own or want to see what it's going to cost, if it's after the fact, you've already ordered the job and there's a few parts and pieces, there's an additional rate table you need to use. You need to carry and pick on a work order upcharge. It's about 15% um, in addition to what the standard is. We have new, uh, we have to reset machines. We have to set new to, to finish that one color on one or two doors or something to that effect. Um, so, so it does cost more. Every once in a while, if you'll submit them to us, I'll look at it and say, no, this thing, it's a melamine shelf or something. There's no reason to do an upcharge. But, but that's kind of a decision that's made on our end. So it's typically best if you just submit the work order form and just say for, for quote only or for price only, and, and I'll send you back a price on it. And then, then you can say, yeah or nay, we want to want to eat, or no, we don't, we'll just make it work without, without doing that. We don't want to pay for that. So, um, but you have the choice in that matter. So, so that's the, the basic rundown on the order process. Um, good, about 25 minutes here. I um, want to spend some time in the CAD mode of Cabinet Vision. This has been one that we have, we've not done a lot of training with anybody on. Um, it's kind of uh, an intuitive sort of layout in CAD, but, but there's some, some little quirks to it, and there's also some some, some really nice tools in it that a lot of people aren't aware of. So I want to talk about the CAD mode um, and print your drawings. Um, if we come back to our room, if I right now up to the top of my screen and hit print, it's going to print exactly what I see on my screen, including all of the black background. So if you like using toner, this is the way to go. Um, I even you go to the, the white background, even though um, it's going to print things this way, but it will make your line lighter or darker depending on which color is showing here. Sometimes it's really hard to see your dimension lines. You can't scale it. It just fills it on the page. It gives you very little control over it if you just go to print. So um, so personally, don't ever print that way. Um, and I would recommend that you don't either. Um, the, the best way to print is to use your drawings tab. And I think I briefly did this yesterday. Um, we're going we're gonna to show it again here. Um, what I want to do is in several modes, I'm going to create some scenes here. So again, I want to right click somewhere in the background, somewhere not on a cabinet or a wall. So anywhere else, I can just right click and say to drawing. Look down here in the bottom left corner, it's, it's telling you that it's working there. Once I see dimension lines on there, it's done. So then I can click and I can move around the zoom again. Um, I also do the same thing in 3D. I can come here and position however I want, right click and say to drawing. Now in some, some computers this is going to do something different. Um, right now mine is set the correct way. Um, if I properties, I want it to go to a hidden line. If I pick bitmap and I do to drawing, it's going to actually save this screenshot with the black background and the color and all of that stuff and I don't want that for a drawing mode. All I want is a hidden line. So I'd always recommend making sure the hidden line is selected there. So um, let me cancel back out, and I'm going to come out here and say right-click, to drawing. Modes tend to take a little bit longer, and especially if you've got a complex door style or lots of molding or countertops or uh, appliance stuff, all of those things take some time. So there I'm done. Um, now I could do the elevation views too. In fact, let's do one, and I'll show you the uh, faster way of doing this. But um, elevation modes, I can right-click. Right and say to drawing also. It'll go through and generate the drawings. I see my finished end icon. Notice no dimensions yet. If you look in the bottom left corner here, it says removing overlapped lines. It's it's getting rid of some of the CAD lines that are shown here. There's lots and lots of little lines in here. And what we're doing now is really increasing the, the size of this file. So it tries to get rid of any duplicate lines. So it takes a little longer to do that sometimes. Um, but you see our dimensions in here. Um, so now, now I come back over to whatever view I want. I could, I could even do a two drawing here on my reports view if I wanted to. Um, so there, I've saved that. So now I'm going to come to my drawings page. So in my drawings page, what I'm looking at here is an actual piece of paper. Um, it, there's nothing on screen to tell me the size of this paper. If I, uh, if right click and say properties. 
can go to paper and I can put in whatever paper size I, I want. Our, we have a printer that will do 11 by 17 and that's typically the size I will, I will do on everything. Some of you have plotters um, or large format printers. You can use an existing one here or you can, if I push cancel and go out here to paper sizes, you can create your own. You can make a new paper size. You can make it full blueprint size, take it to Kinko's or Staples or whoever and have them print it for you. Um, however you want to do it. Um, but, but this is what we call the paper space or your drawing mode. Um, in this mode then, let's, let's go in here and let's pick a, a, a paper here. I'm going to pick 11 by 17. Um, now I can kind of see it a lot there. I'm in landscape view. Um, over here on the left corner are the scenes that I made. That's these are the, the things when I click, right-clicked and said two drawings. So if I click on those, I see a little preview of them, of the different modes I saved. So there's my object list, even in the reports view. So I'm going to do a quick save. Um, the reason I save here is, is that CAD mode, if you're going to have a crash, um, <laughs> typically is going to happen in your in your CAD mode. Um, so, and the more lines we get out here, the easier it is for the system to, to get its wires crossed and crash on you. So just save off and when you're in any mode, but especially in CAD mode. So what I can do now is I can either click, drag this out and play it. In this case, it's scaled pretty, pretty well for the, for the page. I might be able to get away with a little bigger on here though. So what I want to do, notice the dot, dotted red line around this. This is a scene window. It's one of my available scenes. I see a check mark saying that's being used on one of my pages. If I right click on a scene, I can fill an individual scene. Let's try five eighths to one inch or to one foot. See if it fitted on there. Yeah, it looks like it'll fit. So I can go up to, to match whatever I want. Um, the draw scene modes that I, for the scene pictures, the snapshots that I took um, are static. So if I make this drawing and then I go back and change something in my layout, um, back here and deleted a cabinet or changed the length of a wall or something to that effect. If I came back to my drawings mode, these drawings do not refresh. You, you have to delete them and take another snapshot. It's only a static drawing. It, it, it's a way to print it in here. It doesn't, it doesn't allow for um, those to move with your with drawings. There is a mode where it's uh, called live view drawing. Um, it makes your file sizes very big and and it doesn't even work that well uh, most of the time, so we just avoid that. But um, and so I'm going to drag this on here. Um, some sometimes what you might want to do is set a. Let me just right click on this scene. I'm going to delete it. Notice my check mark disappeared up here. Sometimes you're going to want to put multiple views on the same sheet. Um, if I do that, I could I could do clean sheet to totally wipe it clean. Um, but I could also go scale. Let's knock the scale down to 3 8 inch. And I did that instead of on individual scene, I did it on the, on my paper. So now if I did that, I can kind of drag my scenes onto the screen. They are all set with that same scale on it. So I can fit multiple screens. If I find this on big blueprint paper, this might be really practical. On a little 11 by 17, this is going to be impossible to read. So, so you probably wouldn't do this there. But, um, but just to show you that you can, this one up a little bit. Scale on a 3D drawing is a little squirrely because it, it's, it doesn't really equate anything. Um, it's a perspective drawing. so um, And I can put the object list on here too if I want. That's going to be really over the top of everything, but um, but you kind of get the idea. Um, now one thing you can do, you can move scenes of your paper, and then if I print, that wouldn't show up. The other thing you do, like on this object listing, there's a lot of information there that I don't even want. Um, I just really wanted this section over here. So what I could do is, notice I've got that scene selected, red dot line around it. I could come in here and click on CAD, the CAD mode, but I've isolated this scene. So now I can edit this scene. I can take all that information and just delete it. Um, Takes it back out to my CAD mode. Now I can fit that thing on my screen, right? Um, the other thing I could do, I could come in and go to CAD mode on this scene. It's running really, really slow right now with this meeting linked up, but 
Um, I could come in here and put dimension lines. I could add annotations or notes. I could do a little cloud revision bubble that shows a pop-up uh, close-up of my, of my crown profile. Um, all of those things are possible. Um, I'd like to see a couple of, of those tools and how they work. Um, before I do that, I want to show you the, the wall elevation tool that is super, super handy. Um, I've got a, a job with dozens of wall elevations. It would be a while to go through and say right click and insert, or excuse me, two drawing every time, right click, two drawing, right click, two drawing on every elevation you have through the whole job. So a shortcut to that is to go to your reports view, and instead of going to your drawings mode, this time in, under reports view, I'm going to click wall elevations. Now, here, I don't want to include empty walls. I only want to include walls that have cabinets on them. So I can select individual ones by holding my control key, or I can just say select all. And then I'm going to tell it to go to drawing. I want to go to 11 by 17. That's done. So now if I go my drawings mode, I have all of these snapshots that it's taken for me. They're dimensioned. I also have a list at the bottom of my parts um, that are the cabinets that are in that wall elevation. So if I cycle through these, I can see now, this layout of this title block can be customized as well, and that's something else I want to talk about today. Uh, let's get into the uh, CAD mode first, and, and you can kind of see in there uh, how this works. Oops, back into the drawings mode. In this case, to start a new sheet. Um, you can cycle through the individual sheets we've got in there now. Um, there's different sheets that we've made drawings on. But let's start a new one, though, and it's blank. A couple things I can do with a blank sheet is I could right click and let's add a title block to it. But some of our title blocks are in here already, so I can click on that one and say OK. So that's a kind of generic title block of ours. Uh, if you want to customize a title block for this kind of a use or customize for a wall title block, you go to your drawings library. Now, under a drawings library, so here I can pick. Uh, that's the title block we just looked at. Um, if I go to elevations, this is the wall elevation sheet that we're looking at here in the background right now. So I could go on to each of these and uh, let's, see, let's go back to uh, title block. Let's say um, edit right here. Now I can customize this. I can put in my own lines. I can put in my logo. Um, I will warn on logos that the more you don't want to use a super high resolution logo for this. If you do, it will make each of these pages you add that logo to, uh, it, your file size starts getting very, very big. You can get files that are so unmanageable that you, it just runs painfully slow on your computer. So keep your title block simple if you can, um, or your logo simple. Um, a, a low resolution on your logo. Uh, the other thing you can do is put in text or uh, like I've got some of these here. You'll notice some of this like draw number and it's got brackets around it. This is a variable. If I click somewhere to put an AB text tool and I want to put text right here, um, I could type in whatever I want. Notice it's yellow. I could come here and just change that to whatever color I want here. Um, move around on my title block. Um, but I also put in variables. Again, my default color is yellow. Let's change it to black before I place it. I'll just click here. Now, instead of typing something in here, I can click on this. This is where my formulas are. So I can say uh, the job, the job name, the job, search sorter number, the, the, the shipping address. There's all kinds of information here that you can have. There we go, user. This is your information. Um, customer information right here. So you can make this title block all populate. If I exit out of here, I'm not going to change this here, but let's go that title block. You'll notice here that, that job default, that's because I never gave this job a name, but had I given it a name, it would automatically fill that. It puts uh, today's date. It's kind of a different format of date, but um, you can put information you can you can customize your title block to auto populate all of those things so um, it, it works really really handy uh, if you need help doing your own title block I can help you with that but 
A um, couple of things here. If we uh, draw out a, let's just take a, a simple elevation. Let's just pull this one out. One of the CAD tools that are in here. If I go to my CAD mode on this scene, um, a lot of the pretty self-explanatory. Um, the help menu has a lot of good help about them. Um, but we'll just take some trial and error. Um, dimensioning, if you ever see dimensions that you're not so happy with the way that it lays out, um, you can click on any of these and delete an individual dimension or a whole group of dimensions. I can just say delete, and I can put in my own dimensions if I want. Um, I can put in leaders doing something like, uh, I don't know what scale is going to be on this. There we go. If I, then I can put, oh, that was just a leader. I can also do a text leader. This is what I thought I had. If I did a text leader like that, then I could say uh, trash roll out. And it notes it on your on your screen, that sort of thing. Another thing you can do, this is a, a not very commonly used thing, and again, I would weren't doing this too heavily because, again, your images will take up a lot of file size. But let me just pull up a website. I have Revishelf's website open here. Um, say you wanted a specific pullout in here, and I'm just going to pick this one. I'm going to right click on that picture, save the image. Um, we'll just save it out here to my to my desktop. Um, just call it Revishelf accessory. So um, now what I can do is come in here to my CAD mode. I'm going to go to CAD on this scene, and I'm going to use the Insert tool. I'm going to insert an image. So then I can browse. I can go out to my out to my top, and let's just pick that row shelf access. There it is. So now I can save that. Um, this gets really big. Um, I'm not sure why they don't have a, a way of clicking on the corner and scaling. If I click here, it's going to skew it. Um, so I'm going to undo that. If I click on that picker, though, up here what I can do is I can just say on my width, let's divide that by 2, and let's divide that by 2 so it scales. That's kind of a silly way of doing it. but um, Anyway, so I can put in my drawings what the item is, something like that. So that's a kind of a handy tool. Um, there's all kinds of other tools in here that you can use. You can you can make your drawings as as simple or ornate as you as you want. It's it's totally total to you. Um, the um, CAD mode. A couple other things in CAD mode that are that are nice to to be aware of. Um, before we even went to the drawing space, we just right clicked and said to drawing. Sometimes there's CAD notes that you want to make out here on your drawing page, and you can do that. There's a CAD button right here, and it takes you to the exact same mode. This is why I keep my color yellow or some other bright color, because then I can write over the top of my black background um, and have in my CAD mode. Um, another thing that you can do, let me exit out of the CAD mode. I'll just tap escape a few times. Rather than go to CAD, in version 8, it's got a shortcut where all you do is double click anywhere on a screen, doesn't matter what view you're in, as long as you're not clicking on a cabinet or a wall. Um, if I double click, it puts me directly into CAD mode. So now that I'm in here, now I can draw my lines, I can um, do cloud revisions, I can do my leaders or text notes, whatever you want to do to, to get this all tricked out as, as ornate as you want. Um, then if I come back out here and that CAD stays on my screen, if I right click um, and go to properties, on layers, I scroll to the bottom of this, I've got CAD as an option here. So I can turn it off visibly. If I say OK, that CAD disappears. So now my CAD's hidden. I'm going to come back to that and turn it back on. If I turn it off, it wouldn't go to drawing. But in this case, let's leave the pencil on, because now what I want to do is right click and say to drawing just did before, but now my CAD notes are going to be part of that. So whatever CAD I put in the drawing shows up here. Um, another, another really nice uh, uh, feature on the on CAD is if I go to a, 
individual cabinet. Let's say it's this one here. Um, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put a, let's see, let's put an accessory in it. Um, accessories and a drawer insert, spice inserts, and let's just pick one of these. I'm just going to throw it here. I'm not going to size it correctly or anything yet. Oops, I put two of them. Oh, nope, it moved on me. Do that again. There we go. Okay, so we've got a, a spice insert. It's not positioned. It's not sized correctly, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. It's inside this cabinet, right? Um, make sure we remember that it's in there because from a front draw mode, I'm not going to see it there. All I see is the cabinet, and it'll be the same from out at my room level also. So uh, what I'm going to do is actually come in here to this cabinet and CAD. I'll say something like this. I'll do a let's do a text leader. And put a CAD note on it. So in the cabinet level, if I escape back out to my room, notice there's nothing here. You don't see it. Um, I still go to this cabinet though, right click and say properties. Under my properties menu, I can now say show elevation CAD. This is going to transfer cabinet level CAD lines to my room level so they're visible. So if I say OK, now there's my cabinet level CAD. If I took that cabinet and moved it later on because of some layout change in the job, I'll just move it out in space here. Um, my CAD stays with that cabinet. So that's kind of nice way of keeping track of your CAD lines. Um, so you can turn them off easy from the room, lo room level views if you want and then go back and see them in the cabinet level and turn them back on later to print or whatever you want to do with that. Um, you can do in CAD mode again here I'll just double click in the background. Um, you can also insert things like drawing symbols if you want. Um, if you want to do a drawing symbol like this I can just drag and drop that symbol up. Oh of course I made it black. Let's highlight over it. Um, so I can set my elevation views like that. I can also, under the insert tool, I can import DXF images. If you have an AutoCAD image that you want to, to bring something in, you can import those just fine. Um, and all these other tools, a text box or a single line of text. Um, these tools here for, for modifying or altering the lines you have. Um, if I have multiple lines drawn out here, um, I can do things like trim. That line back to an intersection point um, can crop like that. Uh, offset, I can offset a line. Bend line. I could join a line. Here I can pick, um, let's say, a fillet or a, a chamfer. Let's let's just do a fillet here, and we'll tell it a three-inch radius. So I'm going to click on one line and then click on another line, so the radius is that corner. All of these cats tools can be used in drawing annotation, it can be used in your title block layout, uh, it can be used in your uh, type of a title block. You can also do individual assemblies. If you had a, a really custom assembly um, and you wanted to show a detailed drawing, an architect wanted to see a detailed drawing of this cabinet, I could come in here and say to drawing on the base view, I could do it on the plan do it on my view, and I could do a view of it. I could come back out here to my drawings page, make a new drawing, and I would have those scenes available to drag, and drop, scale however I wanted. I'm not going to scale them here right now, but you could you could lay this out in old drafting rules. Um, like this, um, kind of a thing to give somebody a, a view of an individual cabinet if you needed to for whatever reason. Um, let's other thing in CAD that is a new feature to Cabinet Vision, but it's kind of a kind of a cool feature. I think I talked about the hidden cat or the, the saved camera views yesterday, um, just briefly. But um, in, in 3D mode, notice my CAD view is, is blank. It, it doesn't allow me to do anything. It's grayed out. Uh, if I right-click in the background and say Save Camera, hold Camera 1, it's fine. Now if I go back up here and go to my Camera 1, 
lock oriented there. I can't turn this anymore. So now this has a, a set drawing plane. Now I can put CAD notes on. on. Now I can annotate in 3D as well. Um, so and and then if I exit back out here, if I unlock my orientation, I can spin this room around. My CAD is gone. It's hidden on that one drawing plane. So if I go back to camera one, it'll bring back my CAD notes. They're they're still there even though they're invisible from all of these modes. Um, CAD is another section that that just takes takes a little bit of work. Um, You've just got to play with it. Um, I just encourage you to, to practice and try uh, fiddling around with, with the different different things you can do in it. Um, let's see. We're we're out of time here. There's a couple of other things I wanted to show you. Um, just really quickly, the uh, Google SketchUp objects. If anybody ever has reason to do that sort of thing, um, there's ways you can can look online and get Google SketchUp objects or download SketchUp. It's a free program. You can model things in 3D. Uh, this range, for example, I modeled um, in a, a SketchUp type program. Um, and it takes some time to get used to the stuff, but once you learn how they work, it's it's really not too bad. Uh, and it got a power to show what you want to show. You can, can uh, invert SketchUp items, though, either here to a job level or if you put an empty Subassembly container on a wall. You could come to that subassembly container. Let me just put one in here. Subassembly container. You could double click on that subassembly container to go to the cabinet level. In the cabinet level now, here I can also import a SketchUp model. I could go here, and I've got one on my desktop that I downloaded this morning. The Sub Zero side by side, and let's say import. Now there's Sub Zero unit. Now in this case, it's a little little bit time consuming because I've got multiple layers. Their drawing was uh, involved. If you download things from Wolf or Sub Zero, they tend to be way bigger than what you need file size wise. Uh, they're really complex 3D drawings, so sometimes this is more work than it's worth. You're almost better off to draw it yourself. But there's different ways here, so I'd have to tell each layer what kind of material I want it to be. And I'll just pick a, uh, well, let's pick a default room materials and let's call it stainless steel. So I can just run through this. pick a material for every one of the layers that are included in that drawing. Uh, so once all of those are done, and I could look at this with color on it and make sure it looks right, okay, and we'll just say okay. Now, this particular one's detailed enough, it has the logo on it and stuff, but I can come in here. Yeah, it's really screwy around my camera and it's skewing it really badly. Um, that's because my container is only this big, so it thinks it's only looking at an object that big. Um, this cabinet, uh, we'll just turn container a little bit bigger here. To, let's see, that wasn't even big enough. like that I'm still not quite right but now if I look at it in, in 3D there we go it spins correctly um, and renders the way you'd want it to um, and out of drawings there, there's my sub-zero and it would render even very detailed and nice drawings so you can do lots of stuff with a, a, a SketchUp model some people import appliances I've seen people import little outlet thermostats um, I've seen them import bar stools things like that a lot of that stuff is in our uh, open structural catalog, though, so you you probably don't need to import too much, but just know that you can. Uh, one last thing that I want to just mention briefly is that let me close this job. Um, some of you have had times where you have a, a, a done going in, and it's a, a builder doing it, and they've got a model home, and they may have we have hundreds and hundreds of door samples or styles to pick from. But that particular builder only wants six or eight different styles to pick from. Um, or you want a job that just as a default you can just open right off the get-go and, and get drawn on a job when you don't know its room specs. So what I recommend to people to do is start a new job, 
job. So we're just going to call this job um, simplicity. Um, what I'm going to do here is go to my reports view. Instead of drawing a wall first, I'm going to go to order entry in my reports view and just click on a catalog. So now I can in here, I'm going to say for my generic, my bare bones basic jobs, when I do a, a cost uh, bid, I want to do not dollar with white, your box, natural finish, flat sheen, no distressing, or standard, doesn't matter, um, till maple drawers, PVC edge banding, no pegs, none of these upcharges or anything else, and then I'm going to pick a simplicity door, let's an Amherst race panel with block fronts, an Amherst race panel upper cabinet doors, not the alder, one edge with an A panel, uh, not the alder, one edge, not the alder, one edge, and an A panel. So then I sit, I, I will hit finish. Still nothing in here. I can save this job though as generic simplicity template. Save multiple jobs like that though. So now when the time comes to do a quick bid, I don't have to go through that this window here every time. I can just bring in a bare bones basic one. And then immediately once I'm in, I can start drawing walls. Well now I can have direct access to the catalog. Um, so it's a quick way of, of saving saving a a job template. Um, I think that's all the time we're going to have today. We're over a little bit here. Uh, I'll open microphones for questions at this point.